So a few videos back, I documented my journey over the past few years now, working with the Intel Core i9-7980XE and the heating problems I ran into with it with my uncompromising decision to not custom water cool it. Well, we'll be testing that in a future video. Stay subscribed for that and maybe go subscribe on Level 1 Techs. I don't exactly know what's going on, but we're going to do some testing with it. But I did promise a new PC build in the works. And a lot of you all are apparently very impatient because I'm already getting asked where it is. And, you know, Threadripper hasn't even released yet. <laughs> but I, it, it was 100% my plan to immediately switch platforms so I could offload the 7980XE into some other projects that we will be working on unrelated to water cooling as well and to just get a kind of cooler system running and to test out some more AMD stuff. And I immediately am running into some heating problems. There are not one, but two new Mon Mics in town. Say what? The Mon Mic USB makes your dreams come true. Clean, consistent USB power, premium analog to digital conversion, high quality preamp, new unidirectional capsule from the Mod Mic Wireless, and an omnidirectional capsule with the dual microphone capability, a smooth, sweet digital mute switch, all in a USB connection. There's a first time for everything. USB? And for those unafraid of analog connections, the Mod Mic Uni houses the new unidirectional mic capsule with noise cancellation, RF shielding, and a godlike signal to noise ratio in a convenient 3.5 millimeter analog form factor and a new mute switch. Pick yours up today at antlionaudio.com or the link in the video description. You can mod my mic any day. So my hair is just getting more and more out of control in recent videos. We're just going to have to roll with it. This is take three of this video. I'm actually in the middle of switching computer builds. I promised an epic new computer build soon. And I'm going in a little bit of a different direction for a couple weeks as we wait on Threadripper to come out and some potential, you know, shifting of my plans here. And I wanted to take the opportunity to also, as I was building my new rig, pop it in the NWIN 309 that I got sent for review and do a review of it. I saw this case over at LTX 2019 and just had to have it. So once I saw it was released, I sent a review request and NWIN was kind enough to send it over along with their beefy uh, 1050 watt modular power supply, which is a beast. So this is the NWIN 309. It is a beautiful case. Aesthetics are 10 out of 10 right out of the gate here. It has this lovely, you know, LED panel on the front that you can customize and show different things. In my original build for this video, I had it going with a purple starry night effect with Aura Sync, and it was really cool. And it's got these really nice diffuse glowing fans in it as well. This case is entirely kind of optimized around water cooling builds. And this Im immediately runs into an issue I was having with it in that airflow in this case, because it's just this solid, this is a completely solid panel. There's no side vents or anything. There is no intake in this fan by default. You have to add your own fans and the only place to add them in are the bottom, where if you have a full-size ATX motherboard like I'm trying to use, you start running into conflicts if you have, you know, cards in the bottom of your motherboard slot conflicting with the fans. So to combat this, I just threw in a Be Quiet fan and an Octava fan doing intake in the bottom, and for the most part, it's fine. I did run into some issues, though, with my intended build on this because I wanted to switch to this as my main build running with the 3900X. It was running way too hot, like it even shut down at one point and I was thinking that it was heating. So I ended up swapping it over to my Be Quiet case you can see back there and getting it cool and tamed only to later two entire days worth of diagnosing and troubleshooting later find out that it wasn't really heat related. That was the issue. It was a motherboard BIOS issue because I was still on pre-launch BIOS because Asus's AMD BIOS are really hard to get to actually accept updates. That being said, this case is pretty cool. My favorite feature of it is this right here. I haven't used or reviewed a ton of cases, but I've used quite a few that have acrylic side panels or tempered glass, and that is the easiest side panel removal mechanism I've seen in any case. I wish they were all that easy. So again, it has a triple fan set up here, which is clearly optimized for adding in a radiator. It has one fan in the back, and then your only options for intake are at the bottom. You have this lovely LED panel here, and all of this is controllable via your RGB header, or you can set up their software with the little clicky buttons on the side. The I.O. on the front panel, or it's on the side, is actually very futuristic, future looking, I guess, or, you know, modern compared to most of the cases I review. It has your power button, your hard drive indicator LED, 
your normal headphone microphone jack and other activity indicator LEDs, two USB 3.0 ports, and then a USB Type-C 3.1 port. All right here, ready to rock. Love seeing this. I've used, you know, I use so many cases since they last such a long time that don't have these modern I.O. throughputs. Really nice to see. It does support full ATX layout, so that's what I have in here. And then it has a little mounting slides for two two and a half inch drives I use for SSDs. And then there's two for three and a half inch drives on the back of the tr motherboard tray as well. And then there is an extra slot in the front for another two and a half inch sled, but it doesn't come with it. And then it has a full pump mounting system as well. The problem with the drive mounting system is that with the way that the cables are angled towards the hole, you know, because it's mounted basically completely flush with the motherboard tray, both for the three and a half and two and a half inch drives, you don't really have any way to run the SATA power connectors unless you're either running totally separate leads from your power supply to use the one on the end that will actually fit, which is what I had to do, or if you have custom extensions, which again, have that single one, that single angled power plug that can fit. Little annoyance there. I do love the actual organization and layout of this case though, because you have the power supply chamber behind all of the cooling and stuff. Instead of at the bottom, it's up at the top and behind all of this. And so that means the power supply is completely out of the way and you have plenty of room for cable management. And again, I threw in the in 1050 watt power supply. This thing is a beast. Fan stays off pretty much all the time. And since I have those fans blowing air directly onto the power supply, it already, it never really needs to kick on the fan, which means less noise in the system. Able to power everything I needed, especially since I was originally putting a beefy rig in here. And then my intended build that I switched to that was supposed to go in this case is the, are the parts we're going to talk about, which is the Asus Crosshair 8 Hero Wi-Fi. Great motherboard for overclocking. Great layout overall. Had the PCIe layout that I wanted. I'm still downgrading and I have another segment to this video that I'm going to cut in that talks about why I'm downgrading in the short term. Uh, along with the AMD 3900X, I had started with what is in here now, which is the Noctua U12S. Uh, dual fan CPU cooler, and then I ran, moved to the D15S, and that's when I was running into heating troubles. So that is what is my intention for this case, but currently the processor's in my other case with a Corsair H150i Pro, which is a 280 millimeter AIO, and that's running great as well. Storage-wise, I have a normal Sabrent, just normal NVMe SSD. Not the fastest thing in the world, but pretty solid, been reliable for me so far. I have a stack of them. And then I also got one of their PCIe 4.0 NVMe drives, which that thing is getting up to four gigabytes read and writes. It has this beefy heat sink on it, but really, really fast drive. And you all know how, you know, crazy high bit rate I record things and things like that. So that is a necessity. But I also need bulk storage for additional games and my video work and cache files from Resolve and pr proxies and things like that. And so another SSD that I got to throw in here, SK Hynix sent out their very first SSD. You know, they they make a lot of the memory chips and DRAM for everyone, and they are now making their own consumer facing SSDs. So they have a one terabyte SATA SSD, got a nice little gold nugget logo on it. Looks really slick, fits in there. Of course, it's a SATA 3 SSD, so it maxes out those speeds, but nothing too special there, but it, it's been pretty awesome so far. And that is acting as my main like cache and proxy drive so that I have something fast and bulk because I've been typically going with 250 gig or 500 gig drives for my cache. And I have entire projects who, when I render out the cache for it, take up way more than that. So a one terabyte drive really kind of smooths over some of my issues there. So pretty grateful for that. And so the big one here is that Crucial was amazing enough to sponsor yet another PC build here. They've been my main memory supplier for my past few videos here at this point uh, with uh, one of their ballistics kits. I got 64 gigs of RAM thrown in this thing. Again, I am, I do a lot of 4K and higher than 4K video editing with massive projects and use up as much RAM as possible. My main system's running a different Crucial kit at 128 gigs. This one's at 64 gigs, because that's all the mo that's all I could really fit into this system. Uh, but it's enough for now, and it runs at 3200 megahertz, which is, you know, Ryzen optimized. It was super stable. It has the profile loaded up in the motherboard just like that. No issues configuring it, and it's been super reliable and stable so far. And I really need, you know, those higher capacity RAM packages without losing too much speed. And this provides a nice little benefit. And I'm super, you know, happy to be working with Crucial. Crucial is actually the company I first went with when I started doing my first PC builds for my YouTube work. I had their ballistics tracer RAM with the little red LED indicators whenever it was being used. I thought that was the coolest thing, you know, back in like 2011. So it's really cool to actually be working with them no longer, you know, 
not just as a consumer, but on a sponsorship basis here for memory for these builds and been loving it so far. Product links to this specific kit will be in the description below. Go check them out. Let them know I sent you. Just, you know, keep these PC build videos happening. And yeah, we switched to the 3900X. Case wise, again, this is something you want water cooling for, not air cooling necessarily. You can make air cooling work. My buddy over at Craft Computing actually did a build in this case where he did one of the, I think it was the Scythe Fuma, which is like the Noctua D15 cooler and made it work, but he also needed intake fans in the bottom. I've actually just got in right before I recorded this video, my order, I ordered a bunch of these Noctua industrial A14 fans that run at 2000 RPMs or up to 2000 RPMs, uh, which can push some serious airflow. So these are going to be useful for a lot of projects. And I may, you know, as I move things back, because I'm going to be doing a lot of PC swapping over the next couple months, I may, once I move things back into this case, you will see it a lot more over the next, you know, six months probably in PC builds, throw some of these in the bottom so I can keep airflow moving. As long as you have that airflow compensated for, it's a freaking beautiful case. There's a lot you could do with it. I am disappointed that the software for like adding your own patterns to the front panel is pretty limited because of the way that it reads and writes the image to the screen basically it'll it can only run at like four frames per second i was hoping for something higher especially since that looks pretty fast and fluid but aesthetics wise you know if you're into the rgb rainbow vomit or you can control it via your, your rgb software for your motherboard it is beautiful i had to have it when i saw it at ltx and i'm so glad i was able to get one and like i said you're going to see this in a lot of videos in future content so we're going to talk about why specifically i downgraded from 128 gigs to 64 gigs of ram and from 36 threads to 24 threads and from HEGT with all the PCIe lanes, which I'm always preaching about to consumer chipsets. But again, this is something that's temporary and I really just wanted more time in with the 3900X. But I'm going to cut to that segment now because like I said, this video has been a disaster to make due to some BIOS issues. However, you're not going to see this rig on my, P on my desk for very long. In fact, I'm probably going to have videos interchanged with this one where I've already switched computers again because I am checking out the Epic system finally. I I teased that in my last video and people were like, where is this? And now I'm here to explain why I'm making a downgrade. I needed to go ahead and get rid of X299. I'm offloading all of that Intel hardware onto another project. I'm actually letting Wendell experiment with it first. You may or may not see videos on that. We're doing some testing with it. And then assuming it survives everything we want to do with it, it is getting retired to a server rack chassis where it will be a server of some sort for me in my server rack or just turned off until I need some extra rendering power or something like that. I needed to get rid of the heat because it creates this giant heat bubble here that just is really hot to deal with even as the temperatures have been cooling off and it's just not good to keep running it that hot. I wanted something a little bit more stable and I just wanted to get some more time in with the Ryzen platform for real world use and the 3900X is a beast for doing so. I just needed that crucial kit coming in clutch for my 64 gigs of RAM. Downgrading from 128 to 64 gigs is not that big of a deal. I have regularly hit upwards of 118 gigs of RAM usage. You know, there's always a little bit reserved, so you don't fully max out, but I am always maxing out my RAM usage when editing, but that doesn't necessarily improve speed at all points in time. It just re kind of improves stability because programs like Adobe or DaVinci Resolve will let you limit how, many, how much RAM of your total it can use. And so once it, once it reaches that, then it kind of offloads what it's using and fills that back up and so on. And I've even noted before in my how many threads do you need video that while on my main rig can load up all 128 gigs of RAM for something like After Effects, which loves RAM, single core processor performance matters more. And so my 9900K rig with only 16 gigs of RAM was rendering faster. So RAM capacity matters, but only to a degree and speed of RAM matters as well. So that's why we went with that crucial kit for 32 gig or 64 gigs plenty enough for what I'm doing and should hopefully keep me going for the next month or so. However, everybody knows Threadripper is around the corner. They announced that they would announce the processors should be coming maybe even by the time you see this video, unfortunately. Uh, and so the processors won't be out yet, but I am in the process of shifting. And so that is the reason I took a downgrade now, both in PCIe lanes, which I preach about constantly, and RAM is I needed something to hold me over before I make a final decision. Because my original goal was to go with the Epic 7402P uh, which is 24 cores, server grade hardware, easier to cool, lower clock speeds, lots of possibilities when it comes to PCIe expansion on those crazy server motherboards. But that also brings some compatibility issues with it and fitting it and cooling all the individual components that are expected to be cooled by direct airflow server chassis 
there's a lot of complication with it and lower speed than the Threadripper counterpart. And so I'm waiting to see how Threadripper pans out and what the motherboards on that side looks like before I fully make a decision as to what hardware I ultimately land with. By the end of the year, you will see me switched to a higher tier platform again, be that server or AMD's HEDT compatible Threadripper stuff. But this is kind of a bump in the road along the way. And I just wanted to share it with you because the 3900X is a beast of a processor. Uh, I don't think the 3950X will provide that much extra performance over the 3900X other than in applications that are 100% multi-threaded because 24 threads is already a lot and there's no added cache bump on the 3950X. So 3900X is a sweet spot. I don't even think I'll be getting the 3950X in my hands. So this is what I'm using for the next couple months. And I just wanted to explain why, because I, I've made fun of a lot of people who are like, I'm ditching my high-end platforms for consumer platforms for silly reasons. Now I'm doing it. It's just a temporary measure, but I'm that hyped on what AMD has to offer at the moment that we're going this route for now. Thank you so much for watching these weird PC building vlogs. You guys seem to enjoy them. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more tech education, PC building documentation. Go check out my other X299 videos if you want to see that or my video with Wendell about how many threads and cores you need for live streaming or content creation. And go check out Crucial's Ballistics RAM in the description down below with my link. It gives a small kickback to them. Thank you so much to them for sponsoring this build. I'm Vox. I'll see you next time.